My name is uh, Thomas Guzik and I'm an editor-in-chief of Cardiovascular Research and today uh, we have a huge honor to uh, speak to Professor uh, Barbara Cassade, uh, incoming president of European Cardiac Society and the British Heart Foundation professor of cardiovascular medicine at the University of Oxford. Uh, welcome Barbara. Thank, Thank you very much for uh, joining us. Uh, having an opportunity to speak to uh, someone who so efficiently combines basic science with uh, clinical uh, medicine. Uh, I think it's, it would be great if you could share with us uh, your sort of recipe for success in science. Is it ambition or is it talent? I, I would say it's persistence more than anything else. I suppose everybody has to have some talent and, and the vast majority of people do. Uh, ambition, maybe, curiosity is probably important, but most important of all is persistence, really to be resilient and uh, don't give up, never give up. The Churchill uh, yeah, uh, way. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think here is especially uh, important. And if you uh, were to uh, define uh, the greatest uh, achievement of uh, your scientific work so far, uh, which one would you, uh, would you uh, choose or, uh, uh, or identify? I would say probably the discovery of the actions of uh, the neuronal nitric oxide synthase in the myocardium. It has become something that keeps giving. First the calcium regulation, then the potassium uh, uh, channels, now the metabolism. So it seems something that has uh, uh, an even a greater importance than I uh, thought it would have when I, we first uh, identified the effect on calcium handling. And what was the root of that uh, discovery? So from, from sort of basic science to, to a little bit translational application, because I think... Well, I mean, I could uh, uh, try to convince you and myself that it was all a big plan and that it was all very clear in my mind, but I would be lying. <laughs> I think the truth is serendipity. You know, you are, uh, as when you're young, you need to do a lot of experiments. And uh, if you are open-minded and you don't discard things that don't fit and look at everything, you are almost bound to find something original in your data. And then you take it and you run with it. And that's, I think, what we did, yeah. And if you were to identify what is the sort of most promising uh, discovery of recent years in basic science, basic cardiovascular sciences, that actually brings promise to, to future cardiovascular therapies, because I think that's what we are seeking uh, after. Yes, I think you can start now to see the um, role of genetics on this, you know, for a number of years, uh, the GWAS years, the beginning of the GWAS years, it started by saying we're going to find drugs and then uh, it kind of felt a little bit like stamp collecting and now you know you can start to see really both the importance for risk uh, uh, stratification but also for uh, identification or validation of new targets with Mendelian randomizations. The other one is of course gene editing. CRISPR-Cas I think would have uh, in a few years uh, uh, quite important applications. So from what you are saying I think these are prime examples where basic science can actually uh, uh, help and contribute uh, for, uh, to uh, uh, improvement of healthcare. Uh, and uh, uh, do you think that basic science can ever compete uh, uh, with clinical uh, research uh, in, in relation to in, in public eyes, I would say? Oh yes, uh, absolutely. I mean it, it all depends on how we communicate it and uh, how rigorous we are to maintain you know, the robustness of our methods uh, and uh, in that way you know, to, to produce something that is uh, relevant and important. But you know, we don't want to overstate it and equally we don't want to be, keep quiet. I think it is important to communicate it adequately. It will be very important. It's the future. That's true. And uh, if you were to try to identify uh, sort of potential 
weakest aspect of current basic science approaches and potentially weakest aspect of current clinical research approaches. Uh, something that, uh, that, that leaves this question mark in, 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 in our minds. Uh, uh, it, it's a difficult question, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think that for basic science I would have no hesitation and I would say methodology. I think uh, the methodology of how you run uh, blinded control experiments, uh, how you are not just uh, doing a, a scattergun approach of things and then select the one that are statistically significant for publications. Uh, so this, I think, is the, is the uh, weakest aspect that leads to the famous uh, claim, uh, particularly for cancer, that was made that only about 25% of the basic science discoveries are actually reproducible in industrial labs. And that is not fraud, it is self-deception. Right, and, and this and poor methodology. So this, I think, is something that uh, if I had a magic wand, I would change instantly. Uh, I would like to see a progress very much on, on this field. So would you think that uh, like multi-center uh, basic science uh, studies would yeah, be well, indicated? Yeah, well, that's how it used to be. Yeah, yeah uh, multiple labs uh, working on uh, uh, the same uh, project, uh, uh, publishing uh, the, well, you're an editor, you know, publishing the protocol of a study uh, in, in advance, in a, maybe online, uh, so that one is sure that, you know, that, that one is power for what one has designed to discover. And uh, I think all of these precautions, uh, I think, should be applied. Uh, to uh, basic science discoveries in order to make them you know, as robust as now we have uh, uh, the results from some clinical trials. I mean, th that kind of anecdotal way of going on uh, was also affecting clinical science, but they have evolved, you know, the clinical scientists. There, the weakness uh, is more the, uh, the regulatory environment that has become so heavy-handed that is so difficult now to run an investigator-led clinical trials. And so we are doing, we are answering a lot of questions that are, may not be the most pressing questions, but those uh, that are led by industry because they want to bring a product in the market, which is fine, but the uh, link with academia has weakened uh, because of this uh, heavy-handed regulatory environment. And do you think that uh, societies so large and uh, influential like European cardiac societies uh, can actually help in, uh, in this respect? I hope so. I mean, we are certainly throwing all our weight as a society uh, on, uh, on, on this uh, side, you know, on, in looking, working very much uh, with uh, the ICH for the uh, good clinical practice regulations, as well as with the Commission in Brussels to, to really try and ease the pressure of uh, the clinical, you know, the clinical trial, the cost of clinical trials. Very much so. I think the big problem is is, is the cost, and uh, yes. and it's it's I guess difficult for uh, societies and uh, to, to to bear that cost. Uh, uh, but maybe uh, in in an improvement of uh, uh, of quality, and that's that's the place. Yeah, the society will not bear the cost. The society can change the rules or help change in the rules, advise in that push advocate in the in this direction yeah and and that is once we say well, we are representing 95,000 cardiologists across the world and we have the biomed alliance so the alliance of all the large societies back in this we, we write documents to the uh, commission regularly um, there is a hope. It's uh, hard work and certainly not in, uh, bearing fruit in, 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 in the short term. But I hope uh, it will make a difference in the medium term.
And is there a way we can try to speed up the process of translation from uh, basic discoveries? The, it, it, we know that it takes very long. The uh, recent uh, groundbreaking discoveries of immune checkpoint inhibitors for uh, mm -hmm. uh, cancer treatments, it took about 25, uh, over 25 years for the basic discovery to be really appreciated in the clinical uh, stage. Some, uh, like PCSK9, move a little bit faster, but is there a rule which we could apply and help uh, facilitate this process? I think the more uh, trials you can do, and the cheaper trial you can do, the faster will be the translation. You understand that if one has two or three promising targets uh, and each of them is a billion dollars, you can't really uh, fail too many, yeah, even if you are a big farmer. So if you make the targets more robust by using, validating them genetically or with relevant animal models, for instance, and the uh, clinical trial more affordable, uh, then you, you know, the translation would automatically become faster. Yeah. I can't see any other way. <laughs> I mean, this is, we have the tools, we just have to uh, implement them and That's do right. that quickly. Yeah. Coming back to European Cardiac Society that uh, you will be leading for the next uh, years, it is unquestionably one of the, or probably the most uh, uh, effective and uh, uh, strongest cardiovascular uh, societies worldwide now. What is the secret of success? I would say unity. You know, it is one society that contains uh, the subspecialty as associations and takes a lot of advantage from that because the the associations the way i see them are like incubators so you have an inc uh, a biotech that incubates idea tries them on and then you can implement them on a large scale so instead of having separate society to have that kind of more of a federation and collaboration within one society i think helps and helps also a lot with advocacy as you can imagine um, also democracy you know, the fact that uh, there is uh, uh, the vote, people vote the leaders, people vote the people who represent them. Uh, the uh, collaboration with the National Cardiac Society is also very strong and very important. Uh, so I like the idea of thinking unity, democracy and uh, fairness in, in that respect, you know, is, there isn't uh, too much uh, cronism within the society and I think that openness, that sense of openness is important. And considering color and size and strength, can it grow further? Oh, absolutely. I, I think it can grow further. It, it can increase its scope in advocacy for sure, in research, uh, uh, in uh, really making a difference for uh, uh, low middle income income country where the relative rate of premature cardiovascular death is increasing and where the political environment is not so much in favor or, or hasn't quite understood the importance of prevention and the importance of health also as a source of wealth. And uh, so there is a, a lot of work that one could do uh, in that direction. Um, and it's not, I'm not talking imperialistic expansion here. Yeah. I'm talking really a sharing what one has learned in a certain environment and helping other people to achieve uh, the same. And uh, uh, talking about sort of evolution or changes uh, within uh, big organizations like uh, European Cardiac Society, uh, what is your uh, stance more kind of philosophically? A rapid change or very slow and uh, uh, gradual? Uh, which one is the, 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 the way to, to progress faster and more efficiently? <laughs> I think that the, the answer is it depends. You know, up to maybe 10 years ago, I would have uh, leaned in favor of a slow progressive change. Now there are moments where I think a revolution is needed for particular things. I mean, for instance, career in women uh, for in, in the cardiovascular field, I don't think a gradual incremental increase will go very far. I think, you know, you really need to have uh, quite an intervention there. 
other things evolve organically. I mean, the status quo evolves organically. If you want to do something new, uh, very rarely it would evolve organically because uh, uh, that, that's, you know, the, the, the status quo protects itself. And so you need a little bit of a revolution there. So what's your sort of biggest ambition for uh, European Cardiac Society in the next two years? I like to transform it from uh, essentially uh, a club of cardiologists uh, to uh, a wider society that is encompassing citizens, patients, uh, that has a greater communication with the outside world, that, has, uh, that is engaged more in research, both in terms of building networks and uh, facilitating research through advocacy and the regulation. So uh, I, like, I like to take the society sort of swimming in the ocean. And but, considering uh, that it's a scientific society, how can journals like Cardiovascular Research, uh, you think, help uh, in this? Because uh, we would like to be uh, helpful and involved in, in such an important societal change. Well, everybody is looking uh, at the, any form of communication or media with fear. You know, you have the... Uh, uh, you hold the knife by the handle as a, being an editor of a journal. So you can do a lot. And uh, you can do a lot in terms of, uh, you can decide what your policy will be in terms of advocacy. Where do you want, what do you want to advocate for? What kind of research do you want to publish? Uh, what is your uh, um, educational, uh, if you like, input towards your authors? What is it that you value? You know, and, uh, and also, you know, you are very important in building and maintaining a community of scientists around your journal, around your society. So, we, we, you know, as scientists, we always are there waiting for this, uh, for being bombed from above, right? We are in the trenches yeah. and, and you have all of these uh, anonymous reviewers trashing your work all the time. And so I think that an editor should be you know, mindful of this and, uh, you know, trying to also help the community to think positively. And do you think a journal like Karivaska Research that publishes both basic and translational uh, research can be of interest to clinicians? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, everybody's curious. It's just how you communicate the, uh, the novelty, the new exciting things. How do you inspire, particularly the t trainees, to want to go, you know, well above what they need to know, but what they didn't know they need to know, <laughs> right? So I think uh, you have a very big role to play. All the editors have a big role to play, and they can play it in different ways. And so, you know, your focus will be a very personal thing uh, you know and and it will be much appreciated by the society because I think inspiration and education are very very important and what is your opinion about uh, mentors in science and uh, potential for mentorship programs in societies like uh, ESC or uh, or universities uh, yeah, I thought a lot about this because I, I, I do want to do something for people who either are or feel somewhat disadvantaged or come from a country where there are not a lot of opportunities uh, or women in cardiology, of course, which are underrepresented, who are underrepresented. And at the end, uh, I have decided against it. Uh, why am I saying that? Because I think the mentoring is very good, as I was saying before, for maintaining the status quo. So if you fit all of uh, the, if you're a man, if you are articulate, and if you are, you know, you, that works for you because that is the way that has been working in cardiology up to this point. Um, but I think that if you are a woman in particular or belonging to a minority, then you need to find your own style of leadership and you may find mentoring quite oppressive. So that's why for the, for the women in cardiology, I have uh, sponsored these places at the uh, uh, Said Business School or the Women Transforming Leadership course. And that is because that teaches you your own way. You know, uh, you give people tools. Um, from a point of view, personally, what I do with the people I uh, 
train, I am a good sponsor. I keep them in mind when they are in, uh, there are opportunities and I think we, I encourage, yeah, and, and this is what we should all do, rather than trying to tell people what they should be doing. Uh, it I wouldn't guess. have worked for me, so I assume it wouldn't work for anybody else. <laughs> I guess mentorship and mentorship program is something we should all do. Uh, but uh, from our own uh, souls, and, yeah, uh, that's, that's probably right. correct. And I think we are do, trying to do that as mm. much as we can. Mm. Uh, thank you very much. But maybe before we uh, we, we part, we can uh, try to hear your sort of outlook for for the biggest ambition in your personal and uh, professional life uh, in general, not only in relation right. to, to your current uh, position. Well, and now I am of an age where I really, uh, my ambition is really to give something back. I have been incredibly uh, lucky to have uh, a lot of opportunities, uh, a lot of people who have uh, been uh, inspirational for me. And so, you know, I think I have something to give to the community and this is my greatest ambition, as well as obviously maintaining my research going in the next two years, which is not going to be, it's going to be challenging. Yeah. And uh, so these are my ambitions right now. Well, we wish you uh, luck and I hope and I'm quite convinced that uh, uh, looking at uh, all the history of your uh, research uh, and clinical career, you will be very successful in this. So thank you very thank much you very for much. Uh, spending time to talk to us today. Uh, we had the pleasure to uh, speak to uh, Professor Barbara Casade, incoming president of the European Cardiac Society. Thank you.